So lovely to be here once more and uh, thank you for taking your time out today to come. I know uh, many are away with uh, their children at school holidays and so we still have quite a number who have decided to share the Dhamma this morning. I would like to uh, offer a talk um, about this self and how it can move into uh, from a very small view of oneself to something that affects a lot of what happens in the world for a positive, how it can change and, uh, and grow even beyond our life. Um, these thoughts come out of this last month of being invited to a number of interfaith and um, a celebration, a 40th celebration of a temple and other gatherings and I thought there is overlapping in these stories, in these events. But I want to start with a story that's quite a profound story and now I've heard a little bit of this a long time ago and I often like to share something that is about the great efforts of a nun. In this case um, it is about really a nun who founded Buddhism in, uh, in Japan. Okay, how can you imagine? Uh, there had been a little bit of introduction of Buddhism coming from Pekche, which was one of the three kingdoms in Korea and through China. But the, the emperor, who was um, in, a, in a positive way being influenced by these introductions, thought it would be good to grow a homegrown Buddhism. And he invited one of the noble families, and this noble family actually had come from Korea. Um, and we're talking, you know, 5th, 6th century, 6th, 7th century, the 500s and 600s. And um, at that time there was a lot of interaction between the peninsulas of Korea and, and the island of Japan. And uh, they decided to choose a young girl. She was 13 from this noble family betrothed to wed, but she was a sharp girl and, uh, and showed an interest in Buddhism. And they chose this 13-year-old girl to ordain her. And her girlfriends came along. Two of her good friends came along and they ordained together. But because there was not enough uh, monks there to fully ordain them, they ordained in a similar way to uh, a novice. And, um, and they also, as being a novice at that time, um, they had only one meal a day, which was an early introduction showing some Theravada elements of Buddhism there. And these young girls who were ordained were given a small uh, temple and some text and some guidance but they were very young and at that time there were some difficult uh, climatic changes happening in Japan and there were some great floods and then some uh, uh, very large snow and snow damage done and the animistic the large animistic following of the country blamed the Buddhist, blamed the ordination of these young women. And they publicly took them out and ripped their robes off and flogged them, these young girls. This didn't deter. They were put in prison, age of 13, 14, put in prison. And then the emperor got sick and he asked for the girls to be reinstated as nuns and to come and look after him. And Zenshin, the young nun, 
she, uh, you know, this is the, the beginning of chaplaincy and spiritual care in Japan. She went and brought the, the emperor back to health. And so he reinstated the opportunity for Buddhism to grow from these young women. They realized, and a few years had passed, that they were just very uneducated and well-equipped and they had a desire to become bhikkhuni. And the three of them traveled to Korea, of which was a great shock, because Korea was quite austere and they had to work very hard and conditions were often impoverished. But they received their ordination, stayed there for two years, and then they returned to Japan with quite a congregation of monks who were willing to come to Japan and help. And so out of the efforts of these young women, Buddhism grew. They were then able to ordain in Japan. And, uh, and Zen Shin became a very good friend and received um, support from the emperor's son, the prince, who became the king, became the emperor. And throughout his life, he supported Buddhism and supported her in a congregation. And when he passed away, uh, she continued just living a very quiet life. And the story is known, it's known historically, but it's also known because the temple she lived in is still present. And why I wanted to start with this story was the efforts of somebody who can be so young and even quite naive, and yet to be based in so much faith and inner commitment grew into something, you know, far beyond this one little person. Recently, um, at uh, the 40th anniversary in Upway, and its founder, John Hughes, a memorial for the founder of John Hughes, I saw many of his very committed students. I had met some back in the 80s when I visited once. And I've, I touched on this story in my last talk, but what touched me was, even though he was a controversial teacher in his time, he still had the support of many Theravada monks who he looked after very well. And they came and taught. And the students of that temple are all older um, and uh, um, living their lives and practicing still. Remember that time when that temple was just fledgling, that center was just fledgling and how simple their life was, and then how this teacher taught anyone at any time. He shared Dharma. So years after his passing, to that center has gone through many stages and developments and is growing, as to many of our other centers and their stories on how they're growing. But at the Interfaith recently, which was organized by the Catholic Church, they invited monsters, monsters from around the world. I'm not sure what a monster is, but I guess they're up there, to come and talk with people of other faith. And they in themselves were quite interesting people, but you could see the church is looking for answers. They're noticing there is a large falling away of congregation and followers. So they're speaking to the, uh, the various faith groups here and asking very, uh, what you might say, sensitive or inquiring questions. And one, one approached me in the workshop and asked me, you know, uh, what did I think about the development of Buddhism in Australia? And I said, I think Buddhism in Australia is still very new, comparatively, 
to religion in the world and the Catholic Church and Buddhism in other parts of the world. We are very, still a fledgling culture. It has grown from when I first started in the 70s where we were helping and supporting one another and one, our, um, our Buddhist monastery that we're building up in the in New South Wales was housing many groups to come and offer their retreats and do teaching. And we had many gatherings of monks from various traditions coming together. And then it moved away and it became more about the development of one's cultural community. And yet, Still, we occasionally connect, and I, I observed at this gathering, there were a lot of Theravada monks, but very few Mahayana monks coming, which I've noticed in recent years, coming to the interfaith gatherings, or the Buddhist celebration, the Visak celebration. So secularism is on the rise, we, we acknowledge that, Intercultural marriages are difficult sometimes, especially when it comes to dying. How they're going to cremate or bury or <laughs> they're going to bury them next to one another and the children have a lot of say in this. So we had these very interesting conversations because in part what we call me and my culture, my practice, my tradition is overlapping with yours or theirs in this case when it comes down on the ground to how we interact in a very secular society, growing society. There was an interesting story in um, a book, The Zen and the Art of Listening. It caught my eye. And this story was about a mother. And for many mothers here will know what I'm talking about. When their son becomes a young teenage, teenager with the hormones raging, suddenly communication, where they had had a wonderful relationship, communication hit a wall. And the more she tried, the more sensitively she tried to connect with her son, the more he stood back and rejected and wouldn't go there. And so she decided, well, they would sit down together and he could dictate the terms of communication. He could create the terms. Okay, how are we going, you know, how would you like us to communicate? If I have something to say to you, would you like me to give you time for you to reflect on it and come back? How long will that time be? So they created the terms. And I found this very interesting because in those terms, the child honored them because he had created them. And in a way, I think when we start to own what it is we see as our life, our path. And we create the terms to honor that. Then something inside changes. He, he was able to talk to his mother after a while about how he felt. They would put little messages down on the table she would write a question and he would respond. How does it feel when somebody is angry with you? When someone attacks you, when somebody is unkind? And he would say, you know, I feel, he would express how he felt. Tight, heated. He expressed what anger felt like. And then how does it feel, you know, when you're having a great time? And again, he said, I feel free and open and I can breathe.
And I think this is something for all of us to really reflect on. Because we come across in our life, in our meditation, in our relationships, situations that we do not know how to address it directly. How to express ourselves. How to relate. How to feel it. There was a wonderful um, exercise, it was called the sticker exercise, done with children. And this Buddhist monk by the name of Matthew Ricard, who is very well known uh, for his work, altruistic work, and work on the brain, he's said to be the happiest monk in the world, <laughs> because the brain scan showed that he had a, it lit up everywhere. <laughs> But his, this, little, um, this little exercise I found very interesting, the sticker exercise. They gave stickers to children and they said, we want you to put those stickers against these four categories of people, your best friend. Who are you going to give the stickers to? Your best friend? The one you least like in your class? One you don't know? And one who is sick? A little bit like a loving kindness meditation, you know. <laughs> we bring up someone we love, we like. Someone then, we may have that at the end, someone we have a difficulty with. Someone we don't know, neutral, and someone who may be needing some kindness. But these children did what you would expect. They gave all their stickers to their best friend. <laughs> We're a little bit like that, aren't we? In our Buddhist groups, we give all our stickers to our organization. We give our energy to the situation our family, our workplace, and the Buddhist temple that we congregate in. And they found that, you know, most of these children, the class of children, gave stickers, nearly all their stickers to their best friend, maybe one to the sick child. So they did an exercise for the next eight weeks, and they have done this on various levels, for 20 minutes, two days a week, they would talk about altruistic views to children, five, four and five, six-year-old children, very young, about the value of sharing and caring and giving. And after eight weeks, they noted, and in the chart, still, you know, a little bit more for their best friend, and equally as many for the sick child, but the one who they disliked more, and the one who they didn't know, were just below. They understood those also need what I have to share. In a, um, a recent interaction um, with a group of friends in Kinglake, I was invited to have a meal with these couples and I was sitting um, at the head of the table. It was a long table. And I was sitting at the head of the table and the wives were all chatting with each other. And these two gentlemen on each side began, you know, to talk. 
I know them, I don't know them that well, but one of them is a retired doctor and we, I see him and his wife from time to time and the other is the husband of um, someone I know well, someone who comes to visit. And, uh, and I've always heard about the husband of my friend as being somebody who is uh, a little selfish and self-centered. And um, he, he cares, but he doesn't show much affection. And the doctor asked, the, the, the retired doctor asked me, do you believe in reincarnation? This is the, a, quite a common inquiry straight off. Do you believe in reincarnation? He said, you know, I'm a scientist. I believe in science. And I said, yes, I understand. He said, I have a very great difficulty with that. He said, many things in Buddhism, you know, uh, I can understand from the, uh, the work I do, you know, the, the empathy, the compassion, the giving of my time and my, you know, everything I know. But he said, I have a difficulty with there is something happening after we pass away. And I pointed out in a very, I didn't want to uh, make it too complex, but I pointed out in a way that this is a very central part of Buddhism. Even though I know there is a secular movement in Buddhism growing, still, you know, the basis of the Buddhist view on karma, and it's not just the Buddhist view, has its roots in reincarnation. And I pointed out a few personal stories that from my personal experience over 40 years in this path that I have no, no doubt here. I'm quite clear about it and not from a belief perspective but from experiential perspective and I said I can see it I can see it in not only my own actions, but I can see it in, in others. And at this moment, the other gentleman spoke out. He said, when I was very young, I meditated. I had a very deep experience where everything came back to just a, a small ball of pure consciousness. He said, I'm just a small ball of pure consciousness. <laughs> I nearly fell off my chair. <laughs> because here he had spent another 30 or so years not practicing, not developing that depth of understanding in a way that his wife would recognize or any of the others who knew him would obviously recognize because often when somebody is so deeply experienced it comes out in a very altruistic compassionate way the actions they do just naturally appear for the benefit of others but he said something also very interesting he said it it freaked me out because here I was, a young father with a, a wife and a baby. And I had to ground myself in a life that could serve them and do what I had to do as a responsible parent. And he said, but every time I looked at another person, before they opened their mouth, I knew what they were going to say. He said, I have no doubt about karma. He said, I could even see, you know, where those thoughts and intentions and actions were coming from. And I said to him, it seems he, live, he, he leads, um, 
he works in a storeroom where there's no heating or winter. Very cold, because I came into this conversation because I asked him, you know, how does he deal with the freezing cold weather he, he has to work in and just sitting on machines. And he has a very simple job, a very responsible job, but, you know, he has to put the boxes in the right places, no doubt. And he said, oh, well, you know, um, the bosses wanted to give me a particular sort of uniform, which was all synthetic. He said, well, I, you know, I didn't, I just wanted to wear cotton, so I put extra layer of underwear underneath. But I know that he and his wife eat very fresh, organic food. He does practice yoga. And he found a way to live. He said, you know, he, it's a shame. I said, it was such a shame he didn't look for a teacher to guide him on how to develop this practice and move forward. And it is so important. If you have deep experience, meditative experiences, or deep understanding of who you are, you need guidance so that can not only grow, but can benefit you and others. Otherwise, it can turn. And he said he had a lot of sleepless nights. He wouldn't sleep. No doubt, the mind, as we know from meditation, the mind just is full of energy. Now, to bring this all together, I think there was one other story. I was just trying to find where it was or what it was. It doesn't matter. To bring this together, we have the story of an individual that I speak of just there. were two individuals. One who lives in a secular world with a scientific mind. It didn't matter if I spent a week talking about reincarnation, it wasn't going to really press a button there, so it wasn't. He just kept saying, you're a very good talker. And I said, well, I'm not sure I have a very good listener. <laughs> because something's not communicating. But I had a little chuckle. So we have someone who has lived a very good life, and you can see it in his gentle approach, in his sensitive way of listening and being. We have someone who has a deep experience early in life, but didn't know how to utilize that empowerment. Now he, he photographs the, the universe he showed me a photograph of millions of stars in something he had found out there. It was very spectacular, you know. It did in an, in an interesting way. I think it was the way he was trying to communicate something of the insignificance of self in the grand ex experience of the universe. So we have someone who has led a life in this way. We have children who are developing an understanding through education, through guidance. We have a community who came into some, found that this small community of friends and a teacher when they were young developed their path for the whole of their life. And they are still friends and they're still practicing together. I don't think they're particularly involved in interfaith or interbuddhist or other things, but they live and practice a lot what they were taught when they were very young, Buddhist. Then we have a, a very young woman who becomes a nun and her actions change a Buddhist culture. Can you see where it's going? No. <laughs> it is saying whatever it is, 
we perceive as a self, a self view, an idea of me, it starts somewhere. If, if educated or inspired at a certain time, especially when you are young, but not necessarily. I'm sure something I said to that retired doctor will make him think for a long time. I was very engaged in talking this process through. But particularly when you are young, the sage, <laughs> sitting up the front here, I wonder how much she has heard. <laughs> then something, this self, grows from a little view of me and mine to something very vast, very great. For the, uh, the gentleman who had the experience, it had grown into cosmological, <laughs> very, very large view. But for uh, Zenshin, it transformed a Buddhist culture in her land. Mm. Like a young girl from a Korean background, historical background, overcoming the difficulties and the... Uh, and would have been very difficult because animism, as I remember in Korea, is a, was still a very strong force, even then, 30 years ago. A lot of people were praying, you know, putting fruit on rocks and praying to all the, the earth devas and spirits and guardians. And that young boy and the mother, that was crucial. If more mothers could understand how to communicate with their children, we would be seeing less of that interest in the synthetic kind of love, in the external stimulation. So there were many things that inspired me. With the story of the Catholic Church and what I'm seeing in the interfaith world, I mean, this is a very broad growing religion, you might say, in itself. The world of parliament of religions. They're having people now in, in our Buddhist culture. We have, you know, several people who go and call themselves the interfaith um, leaders of the Buddhist Council of Victoria or all. they go to all these gatherings but there is a language that begins to grow out of this and part of this language is about how are humans going to beyond religion beyond the church deal with what is becoming very evident, a very self-centered, secular view of life. I mean, it doesn't affect so many of you because you're here today and you're coming, but in your workplaces, in your children, in your grandchildren, this view is growing stronger. In technology, Everything says me in our technology. And if me is not a very strong individual that can fight all the other me's and step on them and, you know, push them over them. <laughs> they found, you know, when they had this um, terrible 
bomb blast at uh, the teenagers' uh, um, musical concert in London, in England, it wasn't London, in England, that the children were running over each other, pushing each other down to run over them. That sense of, you know, self-survival, self-preservation. That very small sense of, it, if I make it, everything's good. And you know, in our meditation, I don't know if you have noticed it, but it's there. And it's there in a way that is very determined. If only I get jhana. What do you do with the jhana once you've got it? That young man, man didn't know what to do with it. Upset his life no end, he said. He was actually angry about it. And it was all over having a meal, a conversation. And out came this passionate voice about, well, look what meditation did to me. Because there's still a lot of I want in there. There's a lot of me in there. There's a lot of grasping in there. There's a lot of judgment in there. And that self-centered hunger can never be satiated. We will find a way to feed it and grow it. I even see it in my own culture, Buddhism. It's a beautiful culture of Buddhism, but you know, in these last however many years, there's been one turmoil after the other where power and money are destroying what should be something that is supporting a culture, supporting a tradition, supporting a practice on the path to liberation. Money we are pouring into massive edifices and temples, beautiful. We soon see how they become just tourist sites. And how many of you are the only Buddhist in your family? I meet that all the time. And it causes a lot of conflict. But what does that mean? Does it mean your Buddhism is working? No, it means you're hanging on to it as tightly as you can and not letting anything else enter in there. The other views, your partner's religion or traditional views. Time to take a message from that, if that is the case for you. Take a message from that mother and her son who was growing in a culture that was very different to mum and dad's. Where we start to find a way and a means to communicate and see what it is and where it is we connect, what it is that unifies, what it is that brings more love and nourishment into our hearts, into our relationships and our lives. There was, let's um, see if I can find it, a little list. I'll finish with this. Um, one of the uh, monsoors, 
is said Indeed, there is great need for cooperation in all sectors of society and religion. There is the need to learn how to create a sustainable harmony among us. Learn how to create more with less. To create caring economics Economics that are not about the end dollar, but are about how those economics are affecting change in the world for the better of all. And local commitment, but with a greater global benefits. I mean, we've heard these before. And these are all Buddhist sentiments. The Dalai Lama said when he heard about the schools, the children in the schools learning to give stickers, learn to think more about others who may need what it is you have. He said it should be taught in all the schools from a very young age, from kindergarten. An altruistic gene to change this in ourselves will take another billion years maybe. But it will change very quickly in a culture or in cultures where we grow kindness, whatever the form of religion, whatever robe it is we wear, the outer dressing we wear. In the cultures that develop compassion, that develop wisdom, then these are uh, cultures where we can start to really talk to one another. Whether it is in a four or five year old child, in a teenage adolescent, in a a couple who have lost a way to communicate and one is confused about the spiritual attainment. In dialogue, interfaith and intra-Buddhist dialogue, Our intra-Buddhist dialogues often end up about, we had an intra-Buddhist meeting which I thought was going to share how we're all going. But as the last meeting of its sort, it all came about the visas. How are we going to get more visas for our monks? So another three hours talking about our visa situation. So we've still got a little way to go in our Buddhist community. Yeah, and then how to grow Buddhism that becomes such a culture, such as Zenshin grew in her little body. 